Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to a session on hope, resilience, and the fight for a sustainable future. Do we need that this morning? We said. <laughs> And we certainly need uh, the wisdom and the words of Mary Robinson, who's been a mentor, a friend, and a playmate, <laughs> may I say, <laughs> to me for uh, many years. And we've worked uh, with each other on various uh, initiatives, each one of them brilliantly conceived, including the Ethical Globalization Initiative, uh, Women's Intercultural Forum, all focusing on an issue of extreme significance to our times, bringing good heads, thoughtful people together to think about it, and summing up the wisdom and sending it out where it counts throughout the uh, population from grassroots up and moving on to thinking in the next and using her power and her connections and her wisdom to begin the issue that is of utmost interest in the next phase and not clinging to anything, uh, you know, like some of us, like uh, I myself have been clinging to one issue for 40 years and she keeps asking me to move on and uh, <laughs> it hasn't been possible. Maybe, maybe today I'll get the courage. But this is a wonderful occasion to hear from her, and we all need the hope, and we all need the uh, positive uh, thinking. And I want to thank Peggy, uh, who's also been uh, uh, a friend, colleague, and playmate as well in all of these uh, initiatives. And I'm looking forward uh, very much. Mary doesn't need an introduction. Everybody knows her, her wonderful uh, achievements. I think this, uh, the, the book Climate Justice is the most timely and most extraordinary um, uh, uh, achievement that at this moment where the planet is actually in danger of extinction and people somehow seem to be able to put it aside, but she won't let them. <laughs> so uh, without uh, taking much of your time, I want to welcome Mary and uh, and uh, look forward to hearing her. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself. Yes, please, Manas. <laughs> please, Manas. <laughs> I'm Manas Afghami, and I'm now uh, guiding an organization called Women's Learning Partnership. We work for women's empowerment uh, and uh, through rethinking leadership uh, from the family to the global level, the architecture, what we call the architecture of human relationships, the way people relate to each other, from the family all the way up, top down, autocratic, hierarchical, and how to change that from the great grassroots up, how to change that culture. And we work in 20 languages in 60 countries, and we need everyone's help, and Mary's especially. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Manas. And uh, I want to just also add my welcome to Manas's and say there's something quite wonderful about the long time I've been working with Mary and knowing her is that w people like Manas continue to be a part of the family. And Mary has a way of attracting brave and powerful women and men uh, to her family. And so we're, we're really um, delighted to have you here with us today, Mary. I know it's been a busy busy week. Um, my name is Peggy Clark. I'm with the Aspen Institute. Um, I'm especially excited for us to have this conversation this morning um, to talk about Mary's new book, Climate Justice. We have copies there on the table. We'll be talking about them. Um, this is a really, really critical issue, and it is uh, so important that we have Mary to tell us a little bit about some of the work that she's been doing on the front lines. Uh, I want to start by recognizing Ambassador Milan Vervier. Hello, Mil Milan. Thank you for being with us. Um, and we also have the Honorable Minister of the Environment from Costa Rica, Alvaro Omano. Alvaro, thank you for joining us. Um, we also happen to have our better halves, my husband Michael Jenkins sitting in the front with forest trends working on the trees. And Nick Robinson is here from Ireland with us today. Thank you, Nick, for being with us. <clears throat> um, I want to uh, start by saying that the program for today, Mary and I will talk for about 20 minutes about her book. 
Um, then we are lucky to have a wonderful young activist, Belmiza Hussein, who is also an ASPA New Voices Fellow, who will join Mary in conversation for about 20 minutes, um, talking across generations about what they are both doing for climate justice right now. Thank you. Uh, Filmiza has just traveled from her home country of the Maldives, where they've just had a historic election. Um, and then we will also have time for questions and answers, and then we will have 20 minutes at the end for book signing. Mary has to leave promptly at 12. She is going to be whisked off to another event. So for those of you that would like to have your book signed, we can do that immediately afterwards. So Mary, let me just start by saying how great it is to see you, as always. Um, for those of you that don't know, Mary Robinson was uh, the first president of Ireland. She was UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. They know, they know all that. <laughs> but there was a little point in Mary's life when uh, she was an, a very strong activist, and we created an organization called Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Together. And it was about um, realizing economic, social, and cultural rights, in particularly in Africa. And um, it was an incredible whirlwind. Um, it's pretty hard to keep up with Mary, even if you have a lot of energy. But um, Mary, I'm just so pleased that you're here with us today. And and, and thank you, thank you for that. Um, I want to just take a moment. Um, yesterday was uh, emotional and moving for all of us. Um, many of us are here because of Mary's leadership for women all over the world and what she's done her whole life. So before we get into the book, Mary, do you want to just offer some thoughts for all of us who are uh, really in shock about what happened yesterday? Well, maybe just first of all uh, to say Thank you to you, Peggy, and the team here in Aspen. The new Aspen. I used to know my way around Aspen, and now Aspen has moved. But that's OK. And then to see so many friends, the land, Minister, Manaz, thank you for your lovely introduction. And uh, you know, I, I, with all that's going on, I wondered if anybody would show this morning, but that you're here. I, as I watched that testimony yesterday, I actually thought it was a wonderful moment for survivors of sexual assault of any kind male or female, actually, uh, because Dr. Ford was so insightful and it was so clear how much she had suffered. And she explained so much about survival um, on behalf of survivors. Um, it may be that she won't have succeeded in what um, should happen. Um, it may be that the Senate will do the wrong thing, in my view. Uh, but whatever happens, I, I think she deserves a human rights award for what she did yesterday. I really mm. do. Um, you yes. know, yeah. That's a great idea. Mm. A great idea. Thank you, Mary. Well, we'll talk a little more about women as it relates to this issue. Um, but let's just first begin with this book, Climate Justice. Um, I remember being with Mary in Tanzania, and you started talking about climate change issues. And so we started to try to find entrepreneurs, and she found Delight, which is a very famous mm -hmm. solar company. And sort of on the side, Mary was trying to educate herself about this issue. This was about maybe 12 years ago mm -hmm. now, and so there a lot has happened. But maybe let's begin with what does climate justice mean? And, mm -hmm. and I just want to take a minute to read from your book. And you say, if there is a climate change problem, it is in large part a justice problem. Our continued existence on this shared planet demands that we agree to a fairer way of sharing out the burdens and benefits of life on Earth. What is climate justice? Uh, it begins with the injustice. Uh, and the injustice of climate change is becoming more and more apparent. But maybe I should just step back a little bit and, and say quite humbly that I served for five years as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and I never made any significant speech on climate because climate change was being dealt with by another part of the UN system. And I was in my silo, if you like, big silo, human rights, gender, um, people with disabilities, indigenous rights, but nonetheless a silo. It was when we started work um, in Africa on economic and social rights. And I was also honorary president of Oxfam. So whether it was realizing rights or Oxfam, I'd be traveling quite a bit in African countries. And I'd hear this sentence over and over again, things are so much worse. And when I'd ask, I'd hear things like, I think God is punishing us because everything has changed completely. We used to have food because we knew when to sow and when to harvest. Now we don't have food. We have to go further for water. Long periods of drought and flash flooding that destroy uh, the village. In uh, Liberia, where we worked, um, I would have breakfast with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf because I had known her before she became president. I was delighted to sort of encourage her. We visited Liberia uh, quite a bit. 
And she, you know, she would say, look, Mary, when I was growing up in Liberia, there were two rainy seasons, and they were as predictable to a day. Now, I don't know when the rainy season will come. I don't know for how long. I can't mend my roads. Um, so I became aware of this injustice. And um, it, it was really brought home to me by um, a hearing that Oxfam was organizing before Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And he organized that uh, there would be tribunals. And I was actually, I think I had my elders hat on, and the elders that Nelson Mandela brought together. I was with the chair of the elders at the mm -hmm. time, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And we were just listening to five farmers from Africa. And four of them were women, of course. And one of them really stays in my mind, and she's the first full story in the book, um, Constance O'Kellett from Uganda. Yes. Um, uh, because I could see that Archbishop Tutu was becoming very depressed. And, you know, he was hearing these stories one after the other. Um, and um, I remembered my father in the west of Ireland as a doctor, a medical doctor. I was his only daughter. I had four brothers. Hence my interest in human rights. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, um, when we went out, he would talk about the farmers. And, they, and, and, I, and then he would say, of course, farmers always complain about the weather, Mary. Always complaining about it. It's either too hot or too cold. So I said to this, these five farmers, I said, now look, is this what it is? Are you just complaining as farmers do? And I remember it was Constance. Mm -hmm. And Constance always stood up to say something important. She makes a point of that. And she stood up and she said, no, she said. This is outside our experience. Mm. And I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you think about it, in a village, uh, an oral tradition, how long is that? Mm -hmm. I think it's probably about 200 years when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Because the grandmother would tell the grandchild, and the grandchild would tell his or her grandchild. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a span of knowledge at the village level. And so Constance mm -hmm. became the first story in the book um, how a terrible storm, um, a rain in 2007 destroyed her village, but she formed a women's group, Milan, that's what happens, mm -hmm. and fought back. And um, so climate justice is, you know, it's multifaceted in a way because it recognizes the injustice that climate change um, affects disproportionately the poorest countries and the poorest communities, even poor communities in um, big countries like this. Um, one of our stories is about um, uh, Sharon Hanshaw mm -hmm. in East uh, Biloxi mm -hmm. um, after um, um, uh, Katrina. Katrina. She had a hair salon. She was a woman of color. Her father had been a preacher in, in the civil rights movement. And somehow, you know, when everything fell apart, she was the one as an activist who went around and tried to bring the community together in a wonderful way, always surprised by herself. And then she came to Copenhagen and met um, Constance, mm -hmm. and they became climate wise women. And I think you were a climate wise woman or worked with them for, for a while, so I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the one side of it. The other side of it is, in order to kind of, um, in a development way, address that issue of injustice, we must make sure that the benefits of clean energy get to the all, that no one is left behind, mm -hmm. that we prioritize the furthest behind first all language in the 2030 agenda, mm -hmm. and that we link that agenda with the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. And those goals, as you know, are to be well below 2 degrees Celsius and to work for 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. And I'll just finish by saying, you know, I have been in California for the California summit. I was in New York for the last um, week. Um, most of it was climate week. Mm -hmm. I was at the One Planet Summit um, that uh, President Macron um, organized. And I heard for the third time in five days, Johan Rockström um, of the Project on Planetary Boundaries, and he's now become uh, a co-director of the Potsdam Institute. Mm -hmm. And listening to him, he scares the living daylights out of me. Mm -hmm. He really does, because he's so on top of it. He's quiet, he's Swedish, and he just sets it out. <laughs> and, um, <you> know, <laughs> and we're not on course for a safe world. We're not even trying hard enough to get on course for a safe world. And it does really put such urgency because I know who's going to be affected first and foremost, all of the people in this book and so, so many more. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Mary, this whole book is about bridging. And um, let's go back to Constance. Yes. Because um, there was a time when we were working on realizing rights that we were trying very hard to make sure that family planning and population issues and women's leadership were a part yeah. of the climate reports and climate negotiations. And I distinctly remember being with you. It was I think we were at Durban in mm -hmm. South Africa, one of the climate talks. And Constance was there mm -hmm. in the room with Fum 
from Zille before she was head of UN Women. And here was this very, very dignified woman from Kenya in the midst of these Uganda. global discussions. Uganda. Uh, from Uganda, mm. yes, who was in the midst of these discussions. And I think that was maybe one of the first that you mm. brought her to. So you've always mm. been able to identify leaders like Constance or like Demise and bring them to these, mm. these, mm. these high-level discussions. And you, we, you were just in most of them last week. But for many of us, um, it almost appears exhausting. You know, mm. there, there there have been 25 climate mm. talks. Um, the California summit was incredibly inspirational, empowering. But we also are, face the reality of the U.S. pulling mm. out of the Paris Agreement. So tell us a little bit about how some of the people in this book are influencing mm. these policy discussions, and really, what is your own assessment of where we are in the policy framework right now? We're not anything like as far advanced, and the minister knows this, as we need to be. In fact, uh, things are not good. Um, when President Trump announced he was pulling the United States out of the Paris Agreement, which he can't do technically until the 24th of November, 2020, and we know when your next presidential election is. Um, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, uh, in a way, it was very good that you had a huge a uh, response to that in the United States, we are still in. And that was what was reflected in California mm -hmm. in particular and made very visible. Um, uh, states, cities, uh, business, philanthropy, um, universities, trade unions, um, ordinary community, etc. Mm -hmm. it, it may help to meet the standard of emissions because, frankly, the standard set by President Obama, because that was all he could do, is not that high mm -hmm. for a very rich emitting city, um, country. Um, but uh, that may be met, but the uh, impact on climate finance in particular, as the minister would know well, and on kind of um, just the mood, um, things have slipped a bit. Uh, Europe is not stepping up enough to the plate, and you know, there's all of that kind of worry. Um, what can people do? I mean, in, one of the things in the book, there are two stories of, um, one is of um, Anatole Tung, the former president of Kiribati, mm -hmm. uh, who went to Copenhagen and came back in despair to tell his people they have not agreed to stay at 1.5, we have no future. Mm. And he decided to buy land in Fiji mm. so that his people could migrate with dignity. Imagine having to do that. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm a former president. I would mm. hate to have had to go back from a conference and tell my people your island is not going to survive. And so he then became part of this high ambition coalition which helped mm. so enormously to get the Paris Agreement with this important fair language yeah that was in it. Another one that I really like is Natalie Isaacs, uh -huh. um, a woman yeah. from Australia who had a cosmetics um, business in a small way. She was middle class in Sydney, mm -hmm. and her husband was involved in environmental issues. And as she said, he was a bit in her ear. And she decided um, to see what she could do in her own household by becoming more energy efficient, um, by you know, turning off lights, pulling out plugs, doing all that. And she found that she actually, the first little while, saved 10% of the budget, and she could bring it to 20%. And then she had this, what she called this light bulb moment, <laughs> and she formed one million women. And I'm a yes. member of one million women. I don't know if anybody else here is. And she's done a lot to promote. But I now have a podcast, as, um, <laughs> as uh, Peggy is aware, um, and um, I'm doing this podcast with another Irish woman who's based in New York, who has done a lot of podcasting. I didn't even know what a podcast was a year ago. <laughs> I'm an elder, for goodness sake. But, um, but you know, I wanted to communicate the message. And this is about communication. So is the podcast. They're kind of aligned. And um, the, the, the byline of the podcast is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And we make it clear, you know, man-made includes women. It's generic. Maybe mostly men, but includes women who've also contributed. We're all contributing to emissions. And um, a feminist solution definitely includes men. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, big. but um, what we, uh, what I wanted to say in, in answer to your question, you know, what can you do yes. is the impact it's had on Maeve. Ah. Maeve has withdrawn her money from Chase Bank. Right. She has a great story about that, a mini, a bonus thing where she rings up the bank about <laughs> their investment in fossil fuel, and eventually they hang up on her. <laughs> um, she has. Um, uh, she has plants in her um, apart, um, house in our apartment, I think it is in Dublin, um, on, on, on you know, windowsills and things. She has 
tried, and I'm trying as well, we're, we're aspirant vegetarians. We're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> as I said, oh, you know. Nick's probably a yeah, Well, he's not, he's not helping. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when I'm faced with lamb from the west of Ireland, <laughs> you know, it's hard. But anyway, no, no is the way we have to go. And, you know, she really has uh -huh. um, understood that everybody has to kind of respond to this, but that won't be enough. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's good that people would take it seriously. It's good that young people would take it seriously and get very mm -hmm. angry and get in touch with our politicians and vote the right way and mm -hmm. you're trying to, but we actually need the government policies and that's and we need we need a carbon price globally mm -hmm. that will shift things faster than anything else yeah absolutely well i'm glad to hear you have a comedian with you on your podcast because she's, she's drawing me to the dark side she's drawing you to the dark side <laughs> because mary's very serious you know we'd meet for breakfast at 6 or whatever and you know we'd have 42 policies we needed to address so i'm eager to hear that and the name so everyone can watch it is called mothers of invention. Mothers of invention. Just remember, necessity is the mother of invention. The invention. So mothers of invention. So, yeah. so let's talk about mothers, and let's talk about what you just said about a feminist approach mm. to, to climate change. And I think for me and for many, many in this room, um, your life is a testimony to the power of women, and, and you are a hero to so many women here today. What, what does women's leadership look like in the climate negotiations right now? And even go so far as to tell us a little bit about what you mean by a feminist approach to these issues or what's needed. Well, I'd like to pick up on something that you said earlier that I meant to follow up on, and that was um, creating space for women, particularly grassroots women, to be at the table. Mm -hmm. And um, we formed um, a troika plus of women leaders on gender and climate change in Cancun, which was the um, conference on climate after Copenhagen. Everybody remembers Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. Then you had a series, several conferences before Paris. And the first one after that, and, and more power to Mexico for getting the whole thing back on track again under the UN system, because Copenhagen had really been a failure. Mm -hmm. And um, in Cancun, um, my foundation was involved. No, it was actually, yeah, it, was, it was kind of a mixture. Was a mixture I, I just formed time. the foundation and realizing rights was, so it was a yeah. two-pronged. Um, with Heather Grady as well, our colleague, mm -hmm. um, um, we brought together on a platform um, the three heads of the three conferences. Uh, Connie Hedegaard in, had presided over Copenhagen before she became the Climate mm -hmm. um, Action Commissioner of the EU. Um, Patricia Espinosa, who's now head of the UNFCCC, it, it was the <clears throat> Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. and, the following year in Durban, which you mentioned, Peggy, um, it would be Mighty Mashaban. Mm -hmm. And when those three women were up on stage with me, um, I think it was from the floor, mm -hmm. the current president of the General Assembly, Maria Espinosa mm -hmm. of Honduras, no, sorry, of Ecuador, mm -hmm. said, why not form a troika plus of women leaders on gender and climate change, mm -hmm. which we did. Um, we all, it was m mainly um, female ministers of environment, energy, foreign affairs in some cases, gender in some cases. Mm -hmm. And it was a loose organization and we actually invited some men, some male ministers, mm -hmm. but we kept men in a minority. You know, <laughs> this was gender and climate change. And um, we expanded the group and I managed to persuade the United States ambassador for women to come to Durban. Despite the fact that her staff were telling her, what the, why, why would you go to Durban? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Milan came and became, of course, an active and proactive member yeah. of the, um, of the um, Troika of Women um, on, on Gender and Climate Change. And what I wanted to say was, after we had um, rallied and got uh, the Doha miracle the following year on gender and climate change and working for the Gender Action Plan, we then realized what these women had to do was find a place in their delegation Mm -hmm. for grassroots women, for indigenous women, for young women, mm -hmm. and bring them to the table. Mm -hmm. And this was very powerful, because when you have somebody like Constance speaking as she does, when you have Agnes Elena, a pastoralist, Maasai pastoralist, mm -hmm. I think you remember her coming to one of those uh, of our meetings of, of gender and um, uh, Troika Plus, um, uh, you know, she's such a powerful voice. Mm -hmm. And this was what was needed. Because frankly, the delegates very often don't know the grassroots story. Mm -hmm. They live in these halls with their acronyms and their UN speak and the blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And they don't actually have to fight like this mm -hmm. um, to cope with the terrible, unexpected and threatening mm -hmm. wor world that they're now facing. And to hear those voices is really so important. It was good to hear them in California mm -hmm. um, because there weren't too many of those voices. And most of them were women that the yeah. Troika Plus or that my foundation had been bringing to conferences and now are confident mm -hmm. and that they can 
they can say that piece. So Mary, are you saying that some of the fundamental decisions that a family or a community faces about agriculture, about child rearing, about environment, are in the hands of women, and that sort of the doorstep of a woman is the place where these things are happening. Because it's quite striking that when you found the child cut, people are, what do women's rights have to do with the environment? Mm. Um, similarly, when we started, they were the environmental community was not very interested in talking about re reproductive health, which in fact is related to population, which mm. is in fact related to family size. But it, it feels to me that you're bridging mm. across mm. these divides, mm. and that you see women as the center. Um, is this a part of the solution? Because as my husband, who's an environmentalist, is always saying, environment's always off to the mm. People don't care enough mm. about it. So mm. does your bridging across these different sectors help with that? Yes, I think, you know, in a, you know it's, it's a pretty obvious thing that women change behavior in the family. Mm. You know, not least with children. And then sometimes children educate parents. Mm. That's also happening. And I'm very glad that young people are really taking this issue mm. much more seriously. I think there's a difference. It's true now that in Africa, women's leadership takes climate change extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, when you go to a meeting of women leaders in Africa, it's top of the agenda. Mm -hmm. When you go to a meeting of women leaders in Asia, it's top of the agenda. When you go to a women's leader meeting here, um, it's Me Too, it's equal pay, it's empowerment of women, it's health, it's education, and maybe climate change. Maybe. You know, the connection is not there. Right. And that's why this book and the podcast and my, <laughs> any efforts, I can, yeah. because I do have this sense of urgency. I mean, you, you, you know me as an Irish mm -hmm. grandmother. I, we now have six grandchildren. The eldest is 14. Mm -hmm. They will be in their 30s and 40s in 2050. Yeah. They'll share the world with about 9.5 billion people, we're told. Um, so that's mm -hmm. why your issue of family planning is so important. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's already so many stresses in so many parts of the world on food, on water, et cetera, and, and social cohesion. And we're not in a good place at the moment because, you know, we saw a divided UN again, yeah. Um, yeah. particularly um, a certain gentleman whom I won't even name, <laughs> <laughs> disrupting things. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So Mary, so let's go back to, to this notion of justice and climate justice. And um, human, again, bridging between the human rights world mm. and its mechanisms and approaches yeah. and the climate change or environmental world. And you've been at this now for some time. Yeah. So I'm curious about how that's going. And I, and I just want to say, um, for many people, the human rights approach is a very theoretical one. It's about morality and about the basic rights. But when we started realizing rights, I remember distinctly, we put an advisory board together and we were with Jeffrey Sachs at the Earth Institute. And he said, so Mary, how can I sue Malawi or Mozambique or something? And Mary said, no, walk back. But it is true that the, 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 the tools of human rights are very often in international uh, covenants and in shaming and mm. sort of calling out. How is the human rights approach more than a theoretical mm. idea in the negotiations mm. that you're in the midst mm. of every day? It's a very good question. And it was the work of my foundation on climate justice over the last um, number of years. It was absolutely at the heart of our work. Mm -hmm. We wanted to bring human rights and gender into the climate world. And I must say, when I started, and my first COP was Copenhagen, I was shocked at the male environment, despite these female chairs. Mm -hmm. and the lack of any perception of the gender dimensions of climate change. If you undermine poverty, just imagine the burden you put on women. And the roles of women and men are different, so the impacts are different. And yet there was no real interest in gender until we helped the constituency. There was a constituency of women, but they somehow couldn't get their voices heard. And it helped to have this troika of women leaders um, working with them. And so getting gender into the climate world, getting human rights in, we needed champions because my foundation wasn't there. Costa Rica was a champion. Mexico was a champion. Mm -hmm. You know, European countries were, were, were champions. Mm -hmm. The Philippines was a champion. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and they would then fight for this. And we fought very hard to get all of this language into the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. At one stage, we almost had human rights into the operative part. Wow. Um, but some of the big countries, developed and developing, wouldn't have it. So we got a very good preamble. Mm -hmm. um, and we got gender into the text, mm -hmm. which, is, which is good. Mm -hmm. Now, the other work we were doing was getting um, the Human Rights Council to take climate change more seriously. And it was the Maldives who originally seized the Human Rights Council mm -hmm. with the idea that 
climate change was having huge negative impacts on the exercise of human rights all over the world. And this was in 2004. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, to, to build that. And somehow, um, for various reasons, the ball had kind of been dropped. Mm -hmm. And again, we weren't at the table in the Human Rights Council, but we were able to work with countries that would become champions, mm -hmm. which is what we did, and NGOs that would become mm -hmm. champions. So it was very nitty gritty, um, practical, um, very focused on you know, uh, wording. We, 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 we helped with wording of a number of resolutions, but nobody ever knew whose fingerprints were there you know, um, right. in order to work in both um, arenas. Right. So do you think there's still a lot of potential given that the world seems to be moving away from international frameworks of governance and, and there's a, a trend towards nationalism and I don't, I think the Bretton Woods institutions yeah. has never been, what do you, what do you, are you still seeing that there is a lot of potential? Yeah. I, I think we just need the kind of fight back that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Look at Jacinda Ardern, mm -hmm. yesterday, Ardern um, of New Zealand, whom I got to know in New Zealand and were friends. They, um, bringing her baby into the UN for one thing was mm -hmm. another um, first. Mm -hmm. And um, she made a wonderful speech yesterday about we too, not ah. me too. We too, meaning human solidarity, very strong. And she was very strong at the um, um, uh, One Planet Summit um, the day before. And she's part of supporting with 300 million from New Zealand for the Pacific Islands in her vicinity. Mm -hmm. In other words, she's not just for New Zealand. She mm -hmm. knows that New Zealand has to be much more helpful. So she's walking the talk and then talking the talk very, yeah. very well yeah. at that level. Look at Macron. Look at, we need leaders. Yes. Um, they, um, nothing has changed with the 2030 agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement with its goals. There's still the framework that we have to work on, mm -hmm. that the framework for the future of our world, basically. Uh, we just have to take it more seriously. And you know, I am a bit encouraged by um, Copenhagen, uh, sorry, by California, and that, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, when I, I, I was lucky enough yesterday on the podcast, the, the series, I think it's um, Monday, today is Saturday, mm -hmm. so, today is Friday. Friday. Yeah, maybe over the weekend, or certainly not later than Monday, uh, the latest podcast, wait for it, will drop. <laughs> Apparently podcasts drop. <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> we had a wonderful conversation yesterday morning at 7.30 in the morning, because that's what happens during these conferences, with Christiana Figueres mm -hmm. and um, Hilda Heine, the mm -hmm. president of the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can imagine, it was just a brilliant conversation. And Christiana, as always, was on the optimistic side. Mm -hmm. You know, she was saying, we have now the, the investment, it's switching. We have now the technologies, the clean energy is getting cheaper and cheaper. We have now, et cetera. And so that's always good. And then you had um, Hilda Heine, mm -hmm. um, whom I had, had breakfast with at the same hour the day before, yeah. um, talking about not only her own country, the Marshall Islands, but she is the chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, mm. 48 climate vulnerable countries, yeah. many more small island states, but also Bangladesh, um, mm -hmm. um, Nepal, you know, the, the, the vulnerable yeah. countries, uh, Ethiopia, etc. And um, uh, they're going to have a virtual summit mm -hmm. in, on the 22nd of November. And that's the first time in the world that there is a virtual summit on climate change. Huh. What does it mean? Um, I had great fun with Maeve because Maeve could have said imaginary summit, you know, <laughs> being, being a comedian, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's what she does to make us all um, uh, laugh again. But um, a virtual summit means no emissions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, very yeah, clever. And the UN can learn. We can all right. learn. California can learn. We can all learn. Um, uh, and they're going to get um, over two days, because over a 24 hour period, because, you know, you got from, from one right. end of the world to the other. Right. Um, um, uh, heads of state, heads of organizations, heads of business, etc., cetera, um, doing partly video and partly live mm -hmm. um, to support um, climate vulnerable um, countries. And we had that wonderful conversation. Fantastic. And um, just in case the men in the room are getting nervous about mothers of invention, we've, <laughs> we've had our first male mother of invention, Kumi Naidu. And oh, I'm sure he's pretty yes. well known to you. And he, we had to do him separately for, for scheduling reasons. So we did him before we did... Um, uh, um, uh, Christiana and Hilda, but, but I'm not quite sure how they're going to do it on the, you know, the thing. So, but we did actually do our session with him beforehand, and he was great. And it was the day that he was going into the UN um, on the Monday um, for the peace summit in honor of Nelson Mandela. And of course, as elders, we were very involved in that. And um, 
Grasse Michel spoke on behalf of the elders and spoke very well, very movingly, but very toughly. Mm -hmm. And Kumi spoke afterwards and he did not pull his punches. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, yeah. he was speaking not on behalf of Amnesty International, which he's just become executive director of, but on behalf of the whole UN, um, NGO mm -hmm. um, contribution to, oh, to the Peace okay. Summit. And um, so it's he, these emerging he, you know, leaders that it, are, you know, when you've got a platform like that, you mustn't you must, pull your punches. You must, you know? exactly, <laughs> so. exactly right. Well, I remember him being on the stage at Aspen a couple times. They're like, "Oh, why are you inviting that guy?" As he'd say, it, it was during the HIV AIDS mm. crisis mm. when he was uh, mm. talking about the mm. impact of HIV AIDS. And that shouldn't the, we? Shouldn't the we? Shouldn't yes, we? we're going to. I want to just say one more thing. Um, this is a really wonderful book, Mary. Thank you for it. I think everyone will really love it. And uh, there's so many beautiful stories here. And I just wanted to mention this one. There's this young woman, uh, Vu Thi Hien, from, uh, from Vietnam. Vietnam yeah. and, and her organization is helping indigenous communities to get ownership of forest lands so that they can uh, manage them in sustainable ways. I'm sure Mike liked that one. Yeah, I'm sure he, I told him he needs to read the book. Everyone needs to read the book. <laughs> but it's, it's um, formal ownership or usage rights to the forest so they can hmm. serve as custodians. And, and she says, um, you say that by putting people in local communities at the heart of forest management, he has empowered people living on their very front lines of climate change. And she says, when you work with vulnerable and poor people, you must believe them, she insists. Poverty does not equate with stupidity. These people have their own knowledge, their own technology, their own systems. These are the people who can protect and save the climate, mm -hmm. um, the and planet. That part of the forest is actually now no longer subject to logging, ah. subject to, you know, because, because really? they, will, they protect it. You know, they, they right. actually cover, and they told me. And uh, also there was a wonderful, I asked one of the women, um, she, she volunteered for us to speak and I had to hear her through translation. And basically what she was saying was, what's wonderful about this is, I was so shy and I didn't think I could speak as a woman mm -hmm. until I joined this group. And it's just, it was based on the right level to enable yeah. women. And I had only one opportunity to ask her a question through mm -hmm. translation. And I asked the question, I said, Will your daughter be as shy as you? Well, you should have heard her <laughs> glowing answer. No way. You know, having seen me, she's not going to be. You know, and that was lovely that you, know, you could feel an empowered woman is going to have an empowered daughter or daughters or, oh, and sons. Great. And you know, it, was, it, was, it was really nice. Beautiful. So, so talking about people who will save the planet, I want to invite Thilmiza Hussein to come and join us up on the stage. Um, Thilmiza is the co-founder of Voice of Women. Um, we're happy to say she's an Aspen New Voices <laughs> Fellow, so I had the opportunity to work closely with Thilmiza um, over this past year. She is an incredible person. She's, um, it's a Maldivian organization working on issues of women's empowerment, human rights, and climate change. Uh, she's a lecturer on sustainability and global warming um, at Ram Ramapo College in New Jersey. She was deputy ambassador to the United Nations from the Maldives and minister of state for home affairs from the North Province. And she was a team member of the first democratically elected government in the country. Um, she's been, qu been quite a, quite a force and a power for this issue. And the two, Mary and, and Delmisa, I think represent hope for us all. So I've invited both of them to ask each other questions. So we'll have a, a bit of a conversation between these two, and then we will open it up to all of you for questions. Well, I'm all warmed up. Will I yeah. start? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thanks. I'd like to start yeah. with when we first met, yeah. when you were the deputy perm rep. Yeah. And uh, it was under Mohammed Nasheed, yeah. who was such a champion and of course, things changed for the Maldives um, with election. And uh, I met Mohammed Nasheed when he had to, um, he eventually got to London, more for medical reasons, out of prison. Yeah. And um, I, I met him a number of times over the years and tried to support his. But are you hopeful that there's now a new election in the Maldives that? Yes, yeah, so after six and a half years, we finally won the fight to restore mm. democracy. We just won the election on Sunday. Yes. And uh, we are waiting for the election commission, though mm. we, we won by, we got 58% support. Yep. We had a 90% turnout, uh, voter turnout. So this is Hear like that, a America. lesson Hear that, that <laughs> yes, that uh, I think uh, Americans have a lot to learn from us. <laughs> and uh, we're waiting for the current regime to uh, pave way for smooth mm. transition. So they're refusing to pave way. So it's mm. in a stalemate right now. So we hope that our international partners can continue mm. to put pressure. And uh, I also want to say at the time when um, 
after the right after the coup for the past six and a half years the new government they have rolled back on all mm. our environmental mm. policies the progress that we made mm. and uh, the head of state didn't attend even mm. a single climate conference mm. single unga session mm. so it was it was pretty depressing and uh, sad for us yeah. but now <laughs> the new president ibrahim mohammed Saleh, is uh, a climate champion as well. He has pledged to put climate change on the top of his agenda, on the development agenda. And will agenda. Mohammed Nasheed so be able to go back? Yes, he so, will be. Everybody mm. who is in exile mm. will be able to return home mm. finally. So mm. we are very, very yeah, hopeful. Yeah. And we were on a panel together at the Paris yes. Agreement. Um, tell, me, tell me honestly what you think of the Paris mm. Agreement and especially what you think of the implementation coming from a, a small island, you know, that's done a lot, but <laughs> is in danger. Well, so if you want me to tell, speak very, very honestly. I do, please. I do. So uh, pa we went to Paris with a lot of hope, and mm -hmm. it was a long process yeah. from Copenhagen yeah. to Cancun mm -hmm. to Paris. And being, in the, as a, being a negotiator, was, I was a negotiator. Mm -hmm. And then in Paris, I was from the civil society because I was not in the government anymore. But it was, um, we were really looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. But I understood when the Paris Agreement was adopted, everyone was celebrating. And I understood why it was such a historical and important mm -hmm. event uh, day for everyone to celebrate. But at the same time, I really cried as well. Mm -hmm. Because uh, 1.5 is where we really need to be, was only an aspirational goal. And mm -hmm. the pledges on uh, the commitments on the Paris Agreement was mm. very weak and mm. the framework was very weak. So it was heartbreaking for me to see that option yeah. of such a mm. weak agreement on such an important issue. Mm. But nevertheless, I saw it as an important mm. step forward. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know that in a few days time, I think it's on the 8th of October, the International um, IPCC, the International um, yes. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is going to come out precisely with what Paris Paris Agreement asked it to do, which is to say, what do we have to do yeah. to stay at mm -hmm. or below 1.5? Um, do you think that will help? So, um, <laughs> two months ago, uh, no, last month, I was back in the Maldives. Yeah. And sh open your hands. So, uh, my nephew gave me these are cowry shells. Yes. They wash up on the beach of the Maldives. Mm -hmm. It was used as currency until up to 13th century mm -hmm. in many countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So we have like we have a history, mm -hmm. we have a culture, yeah. we we have like really really deep connection to our islands, and it's at the brink of being. Mm -hmm. um, it can disappear if we don't mm. take urgent action. And the, the IPCC report that is coming out, it actually uh, says that we have a very, very, very small window of opportunity mm. uh, to mobilize mm. uh, urgent action mm. to address climate change, mm. to, to increase our ambition. Mm. And I don't want my islands to disappear. No. <laughs> I want to take my son. I have mm. a six-year-old son back to my islands. Mm. I want my nieces and mm. nephews and my entire family lives yeah. there. And we want to live in these mm. islands. Mm. And people are thriving in the Maldives. Mm. People are passionate about what happens to our country. As you saw in the elections, we, we are not like just laying back and waiting somebody mm. to come and save mm. us. We are doing our part. We, people stood, because uh, we had a repressive government, people stood in line for 11 hours mm. to cast their ballot. Mm. People traveled yeah. long distance. The nearest ballot book for me was in London, and I was, because I now live in New York, I flew to New uh, London yeah. to cast my ballot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many people traveled. We take our responsibilities very, yeah. very seriously. Yeah. And I think uh, that's one of the questions I want to ask okay. you. About. What do you think uh, is the uh, the civic engagement and uh, the relationship between civic importance of civic mm. engagement and climate change? Mm. And how do we mobilize people around the world, especially young people, mm. to take part in elections yeah. to make this difference? Mm. Because we cannot just say individual apathy is yeah. the greatest threat to climate change. Mm. It is not. Mm. It is uh, we have we need policy shifts, and mm. in order to make those policy shifts, we need to involve yeah. young people, and mm. we need to get yeah. people in. 
No, I absolutely agree. And th I'm, I'm kind of encouraged that that's been a conversation that I've been, you know, having in California very much during the meetings there. Um, that sense with young people of the nexus investment, you know, these are young who um, have inherited wealth. Mm -hmm. And they have a big organization. I hadn't met them before. Um, um, and are they Nexus or? Yeah, Nexus, I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, they have put up a billion dollars this year um, to address how communities are um, um, you know, working. And they want to do it bottom up as best. You know, yeah. they, um, um, with Kumi Naidu of Amnesty, we were discussing yeah. how do we make the links across? I think you were picking up on this point as well. Mm -hmm. um, human rights, gender, mm -hmm. um, indigenous rights, climate change, it's all the same now. You know, it's all part of, and therefore we have to bring the social movements and all the other movements together and put young people front and center. Mm -hmm. I had very good discussion with the youth representative, the, the special envoy on youth um, in the UN system, Jaya from Sri Lanka, yeah. you know Jaya? I, I just met her in uh, San Francisco. I was yeah. on a panel talking yeah. about climate yeah. migration she's, with She's her. a powerful voice yeah, for young people is. in particular, and she's got the UN now to have a youth policy. Yeah. You, you would think they would have had one already, but they didn't. Mm. And, um, and, you know, so there, I, I see, it's also, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. I see pieces coming together more, mm -hmm. but I don't see the women's leadership in this part of the world, in Europe or here in the United States, taking this on in a way that we need. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that, you know, Milan, We'll talk about it later. <laughs> but it is something, you know, and including, you know, um, I don't see, um, you know, a women's leadership in Congress on climate change. I don't see any leadership virtually in Congress on climate change. Everybody's keeping their head down. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that, that's also a pity. Right. But, but I, I have great faith in young people, to be honest. Mm. Um, I think they do get it. Mm. And they get it with that sense of urgency, you know. So, yeah. um, uh, the trouble is, we have only that short window of time. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thelma, do you want to take another question to Mary, and then if you have a burning one, but then I'd love to open it up to the audience for questions. But please yeah, so uh, when I read these reports on climate migration, yes. uh, talking about climate migration, the report, the World Bank report, uh, mm. puts the estimates around 400 million thousand people, uh, for, sorry, 400 million people that would be uh, displaced due mm. to climate change by 2050. That's like in 30 years or so. Mm. So that that makes me really anxious. Mm. Uh, we are not able to deal with the f tens of millions of people right now mm. as refugees mm. or um, with the migration. Yeah. Uh, mm. I, I think uh, this is like the biggest humanitarian crisis mm. we have on our hand with mm -hmm. tens of millions of refugees. Mm -hmm. But how do we deal uh, in a world where there would be 400 million people who becomes mm. refugees or cross-border migration or even internal migration? Yeah. Mm. So how, how do we address that? Because mm. that would be like a problem we would be facing mm. in the next 30 years yeah. and that we would mm. have to address. Well. Both in wearing my foundation hat and wearing the elders' hat, mm -hmm. um, we have been really trying to signal this very strongly mm -hmm. in the context of the fact that there is this global compact on migration now. Mm -hmm. It's the first time actually that the UN has been prepared to work on migration together. In oh, my yeah. time as High Commissioner, we couldn't get that. We got an intergovernmental panel, mm -hmm. uh, I think. But now we have the global compact, and it does recognize, and we were part of insisting that it would climate displace people and climate displaced communities, because mm -hmm. with climate displacement, it will be whole communities that will have to move because they can't yeah. live there. It won't be individuals as much, yeah. whole communities. It's happening already. Um, and uh, if we can't manage migration better, then um, we are going to have a huge crisis. I mean, you're perfectly right about that. And this is what I talked with um, uh, Maeve and myself on our podcast yesterday morning, talked with Hilda Heine. And she said, um, I am told now by so many scientists um, that you know, our islands will no longer exist by 2030. Mm -hmm. She's now trying to get support for what she calls adaptation, building up the mm -hmm. islands, you know, so that they can, and I know Maldives has done yeah. some of this as well, but it's an awful, you know, pressure on a people yes. and, 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 and pressure on so many people. So it's, it's a very big issue and we're not, um, we're not thinking long term. What, I, what, I, what my foundation, the last thing we've tried to do and we're still trying to do is to get the UN to give leadership 
on future generations, mm -hmm. to have guardians for future generations who constantly remind, mm -hmm. constantly stay in touch with the scientists and with economists like Nick Stern mm -hmm. and look at what kind of world in 2020, in 2030, in 2040, in 2050, and constantly, you know, because then maybe yeah. we'll start taking it seriously. At the moment, you know, the, the span of politicians is at the most five years. You yeah, know, yes. <laughs> and it doesn't help. You know, but it's, um, uh, one last question. So, uh, I saw the General Assembly speech of certain heads of state yeah. and said that he would not recognize or be a part of the global compact of hmm. mi on migration. Yeah, yeah. So what would that mean as we adopt the global compact on migration? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bad and bumpy time at the moment um, at the multilateral level. But that's why I'm saying we need those who fight back because the frameworks are still there. Yeah. It, it won't be as effective if a big country is not going to participate in yeah. it because others may follow. Yeah. You know, the Australias and the other are you know, kind of edging around yeah. as well. You know, so it, 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 that's the difficulty. And um, I, you know, as I said earlier, even on the Paris Climate Agreement implementation, it has slipped because there isn't the driving that yeah. there was. Even the alliance of the US and China pushing each other, that's no longer there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's less um, sense now. Um, I would say that business and um, uh, cities and states are stepping up more. And interestingly, <laughs> I'm hearing more about the sustainable development goals, the 17 sustainable development goals, from business leaders and from leaders of cities and leaders of communities than I'm hearing from government top level. You know, the, the governments don't seem to be taking on the responsibility in quite the same way that other things. And, and we do need to bring that whole agenda together, you know? Yeah. So. Good. So I want to open us up for, for questions. And I think we have a microphone. Uh, Sabra is, is there in the back, and also Caroline. So raise your hand. And uh, please, gen this gentleman right here be first, and Manas after that, and then the Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mrs. Robinson, for coming today. You're an inspiration to the women in my family and also the men in my family. <laughs> Good. And also, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure yeah. meeting you. Um, I'm a sculptor and actually uh, oh. most recently started the Mother Earth Project with my family um, three years ago at the same year of the Paris Climate Agreement. And mm -hmm. I, listening to all the words today, the things that jump out to me is that your focus on um, carbon pricing globally is, is the main event here. Mm -hmm. um, another thing you mentioned, which I thought was very powerful, was that women are shy and, and, and that they are the, the, the guiding light of of the change in families from a young age. And then also, I don't know how to say your name. Phil, One, you can say Phil. Phil, Phil. Yeah. you spoke about civic engagement and how that's mm. a very powerful point. Um, so I'm a problem solver. I was a scientist previously, and this mm. is the biggest problem solving um, event of our history. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what, what I see now is that we have uh, uh, we need to find a cohesive front mm. to, to solve this problem. And you've, your book is a, is a beautiful example of sharing all the stories. And mm -hmm. basically, our project started the Parachutes for the Planet project, which is inspired by the HIV AIDS uh, event, the quilts that were done in the 1990s, which you mentioned earlier, which I think was probably one of the most powerful events of anyone that grew up in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what inspired our project mm. is that artwork was a major communicator mm. Mm. of um, people's ideas, especially yeah. people that are shy, people, yeah. especially the people are young mm. and they don't know how to engage a government or go up to, the, to a, a, a government official. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we've been doing. This project mm. has reached out to over mm. 30 countries now and 28 US states, mm. um, six continents. and. Um, we have hundreds of parachutes that are going to be on display actually on October 13th in Georgetown, and we're, we're expanding rapidly. But I, I see, I'm not actually putting a plug in for the project, but I'm, I've been trying to solve this problem like you have. Mm -hmm. And I find that these parachutes have become a cohesive front because mm -hmm. it's, like a, it's like a language of, of expression. Mm -hmm. And people take these parachutes, they make them as a, a community, and then they take them to their local government officials Mm -hmm. And they ask for better climate laws. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. So, so I would love to hear, to hear your thoughts. response yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm very aware of the contribution of artists and the contribution of culture to this whole issue. We've got to humanize it. We've got to do that. Um, I'm close to Oliver Eliasson, 
um, who has done many projects, solar lights and all kinds of wonderful um, little suns, rather, um, uh, for the Paris Agreement and the ice melting and so all of it. You know, so I do very much encourage you um, to, to continue with the, with the project because I, it's, a, it's a really important link and it humanizes and it reminds us of the best of us and that we have to safeguard our world for our children and grandchildren. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's take a couple more, uh, Manas and then the Honorable Minister. Let's take two questions and then um, we'll have others. I see you. Uh, Mary, I was wondering if um, uh, you would help us figure out how to put together uh, the kind of uh, connections and the kind of collaborations that we need so that we could address issues, myriad of issues such as the climate mm. one, one of the most important ones. It seems to us, and we talked about it a little bit before, it seems that the infrastructure of governance and the infrastructures of global order are in danger. Mm -hmm. And in order to do anything about any of these issues on a timely manner and as quickly as possible, we need to begin to think the way people thought after World War II, yeah. you know? We have to rebuild these institutions mm -hmm. and, and connect what is needed in this mm -hmm. century and what wonderful opportunities are available mm -hmm. scientifically, technologically yeah. in this time, mm -hmm. which were never available before. Mm -hmm. But how do we learn to govern ourselves in a way that these positive things can be used positively so that we can overcome some of these dreadful issues? Mm. How do we begin the conversation that will give us a shared vision mm. that then we can apply to our specific passions? Mm. Uh, it's just an easy question. How do we, yeah. change? <laughs> <laughs> How do we change the world order? Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Manas. Well, you've been working on that for your lifetime. Can I take a second question from the Honorable Minister from Costa Rica and then turn to our Yes, and two it's panels. clear that the science and the politics of climate are on different tracks. Mm. And, the, and unfortunately, yeah. you know, I was present at COP1 mm. with Angela Merkel yeah. mm. yes. as minister in Berlin. Yeah. I was also minister for Copenhagen. Mm. And unfortunately, the global agreements, as necessary as they are, are insufficient. Yes. And, and, and we, are, we are not meeting the challenge. You know, I'm here representing an organization called Climate Transparency that I co-chair yeah. with Peter Egan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I urge you to look at climatetransparency.org. We have a color-coded mm -hmm. uh, charts of the progress of the G20 countries, which are responsible mm -hmm. for three quarters of global mm -hmm. emissions. Uh, and of course, there's a great diversity in their performance uh, mm -hmm. with the lagging performers, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States, you know, mm -hmm. but, but there are, there's a range. Now, I'm also the proud grandfather of a less than two month old beautiful <laughs> lady. And there's nothing that raises your feminism more than to see the world that this beautiful lady is gonna have to live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are, bequeathing the future generations a huge carbon debt, mm -hmm. you know, or, or greenhouse mm -hmm. gas mm -hmm. debt that can be measured, you know, mm -hmm. in, in parts per million and, and tons of, of, of carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the largest transfer, negative transfer of wealth in human history. Wow. And the ones who will pay did not create the problems. Mm -hmm. It's the small, mm -hmm. the small yeah. islands, mm -hmm. uh, and even you know, rich islands like Puerto Rico. You mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. what is, what is happening mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. there. So my question is this: uh, What is the role of litigation? Ah. Okay, mm -hmm. into all this because yeah. it's fine to have all the agreements, mm -hmm. but we have ninety carbon majors which are responsible for eighty percent of mm -hmm. historic global greenhouse mm -hmm. emissions. Mm -hmm. And people are starting to sue these carbon majors. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a suit of some children from Oregon against the federal mm -hmm. government yeah. of the United States mm -hmm. for not mm -hmm. protecting the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the courts are starting 
to accept jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You know, courts mm -hmm. in the states like Washington, Oregon, mm -hmm. California. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I think that, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it should be the small islands that mm -hmm. lead mm -hmm. a giant lawsuit or, or mm -hmm. many lawsuits because there is not one place where you can, uh, you know, do mm -hmm. this. But, but I think that we have to move yeah. You know, from just being a nice guy approach yeah. and everybody yeah. will do their thing uh, to litigation. And I want to find out what you think mm. about that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Um, Manaz, we did talk about that big issue, that not easy question that you, <laughs> that you posed as how do we get a shared vision? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are, is a governance problem within countries and at the global level. Mm -hmm. And I think it, we have to work at it. Um, bottom up and top down, if I could put it that way. Uh, local government and politics has to work for people, um, and then regional, you know, in a country, and then um, further up, I think. And um, part of the problem at the moment is there are certain people who have felt left behind. Mm -hmm. And there is a dimension of it that is a, a part of the population that had some entitlement sense mm -hmm. being left behind. And that's part of Brexit, it's part of populism in Europe, and it's certainly part of what happened in this country. And they're the hardest because they're comparing themselves with others who actually are feeling a bit better. You know, so it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, and um, we have to have much more leadership on addressing these issues and addressing them. The elders are kind of thinking about how we can make a contribution to uh, reviving multilateralism. So we're going to be working more top down but really reviving it, you know, really trying to um, you know, use our voice as far as we can to say we have only that short window of time. Um, we're facing an existential threat. We did have the framework and do have the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals plus the Paris Climate Agreement Goals. We're not implementing in, in a way, and there isn't leadership at the top level, and that's what we'll be uh, trying to do. Um, just to be short, on your the role of litigation, uh, that's one of our Mothers of Invention, it was the first one, was on the role of litigation with a wonderful woman called uh, Tessa uh, Khan, uh, who's half from Bangladesh and half from um, Australia. And she was working in Asia for women, um, and she heard about this case, the Urgenda case in the Netherlands. And she actually got in touch and said, I want to work on this, and moved to work on that case. And that was the first successful case. Um, the court required the Netherlands to increase, uh, sorry, to wow. have a, a stricter target about reducing its emissions. Wow. It's on appeal, and the appeal, I think, is very soon, and we'll, we'll hear the appeal. It would be a pity if we went backwards, because that was a leadership. As you mentioned, there's the Children's Fund case in Oregon and other cases. There are more than 1,000 cases now, globally. That's the good news. Yeah. More than 1,000. Mm -hmm. And they're either against countries or against um, fossil fuel companies generally, or sometimes against cities. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the Philippines, India, um, there have been a lot of cases started, and that's all in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I think litigation will be definitely a part. I'm going to the International Bar Association in Rome um, on the 9th of October, and that's what I will be telling them. You know, I've already, you know, I've already got them to be interested in climate justice. I required them to have a presidential. I, I really bullied them. You know, they had to, they had to have a, a presidential task force, and they have a big report about achieving justice in a climate conflicted world. It's on the IBA thing, and it's full of recommendations. And now they're going to next stage. Um, what are they going to do? And then, you know, it's it's important um, that the legal profession um, c comes of age about climate, which it isn't yet fully. But the litigation is very important. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Um, yes. Do you want to add? Amy and this um, gentleman right here and there. So, and Milan. I think, uh, yeah, the only thing is, I, I, I think uh, how to change the world order, uh, the, the most important thing that we can do is uh, mobilize grassroots movements. Yeah. Because unless we can change governments, unless we can change who is going to be our leaders, mm -hmm. we cannot change policies. So we, that can only come from grassroots movement. Mm -hmm. So we really need to mm -hmm. give momentum and find ways to mobilize grassroots movements. Mm -hmm. That's right up your alley, Manas. So let's take a couple of questions, because I know there are a few. Um, Amy, and then the gentleman right here, and then the woman in the blue, and then this gentleman in the back. Yeah, please go ahead. Great. Oh, sorry, Thank Milan. you. Thank you all for a very dynamic and, and fascinating and important conversation. 
I wanted to pick up on the piece you just landed on, Thel, around the grassroots movements and the importance of communicating to all communities, but especially those most affected, in an environment where facts themselves are increasingly under siege, yeah. and we have uh, an increasingly difficult time um, communicating the importance or the content and, and the evidence for it, as well as the urgency. How do you think about communicating more effectively and persuading communities um, as, as you think about these messages to, to both of you? Great. Uh, let's take this question right here from the gentleman um, whose hand is up there. Thank you, Saba. Hi, Malcolm O'Dell. Um, I'm a grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, four grandchildren, but as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 1960s, I started working on climate change. Mm. It, I didn't realize it at the time because I was working on community, community forestry in Nepal. Mm. And women, I witnessed during my career, the women of Nepal and the men joining together, forming community, my, uh, community organizations, excuse me, I, uh, forming community forestry groups. And during my career, I've watched the reforestation of the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. They destroyed the, the forest lands in the early days with malaria eradication, but they went to work. And you can actually see on the satellite imagery the reforestation of the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Also worked in Africa on uh, the, uh, re uh, the desertification of the Kalahari and mm -hmm. working with uh, women in uh, Tanzania, Kenya, and beyond who planted millions of trees, only to see that the glaciers of Nepal are still retreating. The snow caps of Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya are gone. So they've done their share, and it's been women doing a lot of it. Uh, and the nations, Maldives, are stepping forward and so forth. But it's very clear they're up against a tsunami going the other direction. So here we are today uh, in the United States, a month before midterm elections, and people that have been working on this and are concerned are all around me, and we're asking the same question. What the devil do we do during the next 30 days to, to affect the midterms so that we will get the women and the youth voices in our Congress? How do we organize the grassroots? What's are the most important things we can do to get those voices forward? We're looking for suggestions on what we can do right now to start a new tsunami. Good. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I want to allow Ambassador Bravira a chance to, did you ha have a question? I do, but I, I Go like ahead, and then we'll do the woman next. Enough. I want to go back to um, Mary's, um, I don't know if the word is anguish or purposefulness, uh, over women's participation or the lack thereof. And it seems mm -hmm. to me, on the one side, we haven't made a significant enough case, although it's changing and you've done more than your part, to demonstrate that women are a huge part of the solution. They're not just victims. Uh, and you can see that all over the world, particularly in the South, and you've gone out of your way with the book uh, and in all of your appearances to showcase and spotlight what women are doing. And there have been some efforts now coming out of COP22 being interested in what's happening with the Gender Action Plan. But what do we do to demonstrate that women just aren't victims? On the other hand, we in the West, in particular in the North, don't feel this issue with the urgency and proximation that others clearly do. Mm -hmm. And it has been frustrating to me personally. I can tell you when I was in government and I wanted to bring the women's groups in on this issue, mm -hmm. they basically were non-existent. There were very few mm -hmm. and women just don't see this organizationally, institutionally, as part of the women's agenda. Mm -hmm. And God knows there are so many issues that we're grappling with. Today's much worse than yesterday in many respects. Mm -hmm. But what can we do with that message part mm -hmm. or that, you know, what's the most compelling way that we can begin to change this, this situation? Because I do agree with you. We have to be a, a much more powerful force for change. Much more. 
So we have the one more question, and then I'm glad you're taking notes, Mary, so <laughs> you can keep it up. But the woman in the blue, please. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mrs. Robinson, and thank you, Phil, for your leadership on this issue. You have just been such an inspiration to me. Um, my name is Alice Thomas, and I manage the Climate Displacement Program at Refugees International. Mm -hmm. um, I was glad to hear um, you mention that the Global Compact on Migration includes some commitments by states in there to begin to address this issue that's incredibly important. And I was curious that you didn't mention um, the Task Force on Displacement mm -hmm. um, that was also called for in the Paris Agreement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, the recommendations from the Task Force are going to be presented at the next mm -hmm. COP. Um, but just uh, observing this issue in term from the displacement lens, I think the most progress has been made when we have seen this issue um, uh, implemented in other sectors. And when we get out of our sector, and I come from an environmental background, but I now work for a refugee organization. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's gotta happen because it, it's so intertwined with so many other issues. Mm -hmm. So my question is just a little bit, could you talk about your expectations for the task force, either of you, mm -hmm. how that can be implemented? And then where is there also more opportunity to integrate climate change into other sectors? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. So we've got five minutes to answer those questions, and then we're all going to go to wonderful book signing and, and breakfast. So uh, Mary, do you want to lead off? And Thelma, Phil, please yes. jump in wherever you'd like. OK. Well, I think um, Emil, yes, and Milan, you, you more or less asked the same questions. Mm -hmm. If I may, I'll, I'll kind of combine your questions. How do we communicate? How do we get women in particular? And um, you know, and I think was it you who mentioned lack of trust, um, uh, false facts, etc. Um, this is partly why I believe stories of what people are doing mm. is very important. Mm -hmm. And so the book is part of it, and now um, the podcast Mothers of Invention is another part of it. I think we need now to communicate um, in a very significant way in, in human language, which is why I'm delighted to do with Maeve Higgins, because she's very funny, and she makes me a bit funnier than I would otherwise be. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and she's drawing me to the dark it's side. way to go, but, Mary. But <laughs> we're, we're hopeful. But, <laughs> but um, uh, and, uh, you know, and I noticed that young people um, listen to podcasts. I wasn't aware of the extent yeah. to which they do, and the extent to which you know, that's a trusted source of uh -huh. information, because you know who you're listening to. And, you think, and I, I think, you know, so that would be for me a real way. And I'm supposed to be doing a podcast, I think, later with you, Milan. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Milan's ahead of me on this. But, um, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I, I think, you know, the, the point about getting the vote out, I think you made that point, And it's, it's for citizens of this country to do whatever can be done. But I, I, I do agree it's important. Um, and on the um, uh, task force on displacement, that was an oversight on my part. I mean, I, I should have mentioned that in the context. Mm -hmm. um, my foundation has worked very closely with the task force on displacement. Um, it, it was very technical to begin with, but I think it's beginning now to, and it's good that Refugees Council and others would be um, inputting, because what I find on <clears throat> UNFCCC task forces, <clears throat> they can become terribly technical. Mm -hmm. They can become terribly non-human, even though they're talking about displacing people. And they don't talk about people in that way. So the more that kind of influence can be brought to bear. I, I agree, it's the more cross-sectional we can be, the more you know, we can get the gender dimension, the human rights dimension, the refugee dimension into these processes, and the more likely it is that we'll create that kind of urgency. Uh, but I'm glad that the Task Force on Displacement is doing its work, and we have been following it very closely. OK. Did you want to? Okay. Yeah, I, I think we need to embrace technological uh, advances. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in the Maldives, the, this election that happened, uh, social media played a very key yeah. role. Mm -hmm. Young people, we have actually like, I think, highest per capita Twitter users in the Maldives, oh. <laughs> though we are such a small <laughs> country. So essentially, I think we need to find ways to occupy these spaces and not let certain people hijack these spaces. So uh, I see with my students in college, I teach in a very red state, so most of the students that come in are not very aware of the gravity of the problem, but when they leave, they're very passionate. Mm -hmm. So um, I, it's always very fulfilling for me mm -hmm. at the end of the semester to see mm -hmm. that uh, 
uh, I'm able to influence or at least uh, give this message to young people. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to find ways to get into campuses, mm -hmm. more campuses, mm -hmm. more high schools, mm -hmm. so that we could get this younger generation involved and uh, mm -hmm. mobilize them. Yeah, Maybe if you'll allow, um, I, I could actually kind of sum up. Um, my foundation has got climate justice onto the agenda in a certain extent, and we've decided, because um, you know my habit of mm -hmm not staying if I don't have to stay. Um, so it's closing um, at the end of this year. Well, it's closing next May, but essentially winding down on policy at the end of this year and then closing in May. And um, I've made my own commitment. I'm going to be working on women's leadership more top down um, because that's where we need it on mm -hmm. climate justice um, and getting the top down to find place at the table for the mm -hmm. grassroots, for the bottom up, working on philanthropy and climate justice there are now a number of philanthropies. The Oak Foundation had, has its um, resilience fund. Um, Heather Grady, our former colleague, is doing a lot of work on philanthropies um, uh, for the SDGs and now philanthropies for climate justice. Mm -hmm. And the third one, which is your point, uh, universities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think universities have to be beacons on sustainability, yeah. have to divest. I'm very sad that my alma mater in this country, Harvard University, has not divested. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame. And, um, uh, but there are a lot of, I went to a Divest Invest meeting in California. It is amazing mm -hmm. how that is taking off now. Yeah. And, uh, they, and, um, and, and a number of um, universities have centers for climate justice now, and we want to encourage that. So it's, it's, it's all about kind of trying to, get, yeah. trying to get a broader messaging about it that has an urgency and a participation, and using social media, as you say, to get, yeah. the, to get the message mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, I want to just take a moment to say, you know, both to Phil and Mary, that it really is an honor to, to share the stage with you, and that I think each of us is leaving so much more inspired. And I don't know about any of you, but I'm asking myself, what can I be doing? And I hope each of you is ask is is committing right now to something that you can be doing. Where's your to money? The way exactly. <laughs> Where's your money? So if you as you go up to have Mary sign your book, you can say I commit to I commit to I commit to X Y Z. Um, I do want to say just take this chance to say you know Mary, it was such a joy and honor to work with you. Um, it was so much. fun fun. I, I miss you, but you know, like the best things in life, they circle back, Manas and, and Nick and others. Um, we are with you on your journey. Um, thank you very much, all of you coming today. Thank you for what you're going to be doing after you, you, after you leave oh, today. Yes, um, and okay. I'd like to invite everyone to have some breakfast and also reminder. to form That's a line. And Mary will both be selling and, and signing books. But, but please join me, Mary and Phil. Um, I am beyond honored to have you with us. This has been a lot of fun this morning. So thank you so much.